you tell me when you're ready. Amazing. I think we're recording. Are we? What's going on? Is this live or being recorded for people? Both. Both. This is everything. Oh. It's, it's live. Like, uh, it's live streamed. It's on the All podcast, y'all. It's going to be legit. So are we good on Zincast? We're recording the podcast currently. Are we live Into on the the Okay. Hey. Woo! 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 All right. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the first Kunefa and Shay live episode. Woo! We are here in person at the Mina Theater Makers Alliance convening 2023 at Golden Thread Productions in San Francisco, California. Whoa! This session, yeah, oh my goodness, you're gonna hear a lot of wooing today, uh, which is not normal for our podcast, although Marina and I are woo girls, I think. Yeah, yeah we are, we identify that way. Um, but we try to keep it in during the podcast, but welcome all the wooing from our live audience here. Um, Minatna is uh, the National Coalition of Mina and Swana Theater Makers. And this is a joint session of the Mina, Minatma convening and the Mizna plus Rawi Fest that also happened this weekend. Woo! Um, and uh, Mizna is a grassroots organization serving as a platform for contemporary literature, film, art, and cultural production, centering the work of Arab and Swana artists. And Rawi, or the Radius of Arab American Writers, is a national organization that provides mentoring, community, and support for Arab American writers and those with, with roots in the Arabic-speaking world and diaspora. Mm -hmm. Today's session will explore affinity spaces, and these three organizations exemplify intersectional national affinity spaces in theater and the arts. Uh, Affinity spaces have really been an undercurrent of discussion across all three seasons of the Kunefa and Shea Theater podcast. And in season three, we especially focus on queer, Mina, and Swana affinity spaces, their benefits and their complications. In this live session at the Minatma convening at Golden Thread Productions, um, we are going to be sitting down with leaders and artists to discuss the nuances of Mina and Swana affinity spaces today, and Minatma, Mizna, and Rawi's roles in facilitating national cultural affinity among artists of intersectional identities. In the room where change is being made, we are having these conversations and we're very excited to engage with you all in that discussion. Uh, this is a very exciting and unique trifecta collaboration and Marina and I are truly uh, thrilled to be able to host this joint session of these two conferences, both live, live streamed on HowlRound and will be available uh, at, as, as part of the Konefa and Shea Theater podcast, maybe a little bit um, you know, edited for maximum excellency and uh, with a, a written transcript as well for folks. Yes. Take it away, Marina. Amazing. Uh, so uh, thank you all for indulging this really fun experiment. Um, our initial description included what these affinity groups are doing in a post-pandemic theater landscape. And Feras actually brought up this great point of while we're acknowledging genocide and death that's happening, yes. um, we've actually just quite normalized the death that has happened from COVID in our world. And the statistics still point very much to the fact that this pandemic is ongoing. And so we just wanted to amend verbally that language of post-pandemic or use it in quotes because while we are acting, and like the last panel said, we've sort of acted like things need to go back to normal in the same way, we're actually not able to return to life as it was before. Um, nor do we really want to, I think, in many instances. Um, I do want to take a moment here to acknowledge the people of the land on which we live and work today, the multiple Ohlone tribes. Despite the atrocities of coloni uh, colonization and genocide, Native communities persist today and are active in efforts to preserve and revive their culture. At Golden Thread, we are driven by a desire to expand this land acknowledgement statement to recognize our community's experience of occupation in the Middle East, the refugee crisis, and the displaced population. Whether we are immigrants displaced by political or economic events or US born for one or more generations, we all appreciate the human connection to the land. And something we've been acknowledging a lot, which I deeply appreciate um, because I feel like I've been mourning so much on my own uh, and so I'm grateful to be in community. Um, we deeply mourn the Palestinian and Israeli lives lost in the recent eruption of violence in Gaza between Israel and Hamas. We grieve the loss of all those who have been killed in search or protection of home and condemn violence and terrorism in all its forms. We also recognize that any condemnation of violence that has erupted this past weeks without recognizing the root cause of the situation, Israelis, uh, Israel's illegal military occupation since 67 and also since before in the Nakba in 48 uh, is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. As a US-based alliance of Middle Eastern and North African artists, we support the Palestinian people's right to sovereignty, freedom, and a life with dignity. 
We condemn Israel's apartheid system and creation of the world's largest open-air prison, Gaza, imprisoning 2.3 million Palestinians, 74% of whom are refugees. We denounce the mainstream media and the U.S. government for granting Israel impunity as it continues to deny the human rights of Palestinians mm -hmm. and commit war crimes. Dehumanizing mm -hmm. Palestinians and spreading anti-Palestinian sentiment puts all communities in danger. We call for an immediate end to Israel's settler colonialism and violence to Palestine. Um, so as we sit with that together, I think we acknowledge that and part of our community agreement this weekend has to been to sit in grief and rage together. Um, I appreciate being in a space of artists who are willing to do that as we have this important conversation too. Um, so I'll ask the guests to introduce themselves next um, and we're gonna be oddly passing these black microphones that are recording the podcast around um, and we will send it first to Andrea. Hey everyone, any instructions on introductions? If you want to do name, pronouns, if you want to share them, and then your role as an artist, people that are listening might not know, although people in the present company certainly do. Yeah, people here are like sick of me already, because I've been on several <laughs> panels. Um, <laughs> I'm Andrea Saf, I'm the founding artistic and executive director of art to action uh, which is based in Tampa, Florida. I welcome she or they pronouns. Uh, or anything said in love in the South, we would like to say things like sugar. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I, I just need to say I'm here, um, I feel like I'm always wearing a lot of hats, but I, I wanna give a shout out to my Rawi and Mizna friends and colleagues who I've been missing terribly mm -hmm. this weekend that, that, you know, these two events, uh, very important and amazing events are happening at the same time in different parts of the country, which also I think is a significant win, like that we're in multiple places at once mm -hmm. having these conversations, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I do uh, give a shout out to my beloved literary community, which was, I have to say, the first space where I felt I was welcomed to be Arab and queer at the same time. Thanks, Andrea. We're going to pass it over to Evren next, if that's OK, and then we'll pass it back. Hi, everybody. Evren Ochkin, he, him, his. Uh, I'm a Turkish-American, uh, I guess, director, writer, and arts leader. Um, I am on the board of Mina Theater Makers Alliance, very proudly and an affiliated artist with Golden Thread, with, which is a company I like to say that I grew up in. I was raised artistically and hum, as a human uh, by Golden Thread and Taranji Gizarian, who's sitting across from me. Um, and I want to say that um, it, it feels important to name, uh, I said Turkish American, but I'm also very proudly queer. Uh, very proudly immigrant, and I also identify as Muslim, um, which feels as much as a political action as it is uh, certainly a way that I look at the world and morality uh, is through that lens and my upbringing in a very secular but devoted Muslim home in Turkey. Um, and I'm so excited to be here. I, um, it's always exciting to not feel like I have to divide myself in parts mm -hmm. to be able to talk. Uh, and, uh, and I will say this, that Golden Thread specifically, um, before intersectionality was a sexy word that everybody used, the whole organization was founded like that. So I have, uh, I have had the great luxury of not having to cut myself in parts uh, in our communities actually in a really joyous way. And I only had to start doing that when I uh, work in not in our community spaces is where I actually feel like I have to leave one side of myself at the door because they're asking me to come into the room for one reason and one reason only. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but any chance I have to be queer and <laughs> Middle Eastern and Muslim and then talk to these badass femme humans that I'm sitting with, uh, I feel real good about that. <laughs> Hello, my name is Sara Razavi and uh, she, her, and when I identify as an artist, it's as an actor and director. And I'm always profoundly humbled when I'm invited to events like this because um, it's been uh, such a long time where I've been able to engage my artistic self. My day job has taken over more and more of my life and my day job intersects well as, as many of our lives do um, I'm in finance, 
in social finance specifically. I do lending for entrepreneurs who've been left out of the mainstream, so women, people of color, and immigrants. And I joke that like many immigrants, I have that side, and interestingly enough, it's often maths or finance <laughs> or, or science. Toranj herself was a scientist before all of this. Um, but, uh, but that also as immigrants, we just wear so many different hats. But probably the most important hat right now and, and what constantly brings me to these tables is that I'm a parent of two tiny beings with my wife. And for them and for the future, uh, I now live very comfortably in the intersections of all my identities, where previously it was very segmented. Mm -hmm. So grateful to be here. Thank you. And we'll pass it to Saras. Thank you so much for the space and the resources for the city wall. My name is Suraj Tiai. I'm a queer Palestinian writer and organizer. I live on Korea land, um, but today I'm speaking from the Dawi Fest, Dawi uh, Museum Fest, Dawi Fest, um, which is happening in Nasirka, which is on the land of Bakosa and an expression of Anisha Moabe and the uh, Ojibwe peoples. Um, I work from sovereignty and continuum. And definitely, I echo what Marina was saying earlier. That was, uh, you know, I carry that through my heart and my actions and my words for sure. I'm happy to be with you all here, sharing space with you all. Thank you so much. Um, we started mm -hmm. this season talking about queer Mina Swana artists with Adam Al Said, uh, who is not in the room right now. But when we talked to Adam, he said, "Really, a season on queer? Okay." Is this really the framing you want to do? And he asked some really important curatorial questions that we appreciated. Um, I'm acknowledging that now, so we don't we don't necessarily need to dig into that in this episode. Um, it exists, and I I hope that you'll look at that framing because it was a great question uh, that Nebra and I had already been talking about. Um, because it can be tokenizing and essentializing, but it can also be really affirming and productive to be in a sta space dedicated to addressing the lived experience of these intersectional identities. Um, I also wanted to mention that this morning I was reflecting on what we were doing today. And the podcast started whenever I called Nambra one day and I, well, I started my PhD. And I thought, oh, now I'm going to be in a space with people where I can talk about Mina theater all day long and they're going <laughs> to care. Um, and we do talk a lot about performance, uh, but the people that want to talk about Mina theater is actually quite limited in that space. And I was like, Nambra, what if we started a podcast where people, we would just talk about this and anyone who cared could tune in. And that was before I realized uh, anything about Manatma, really. Uh, and I found that there's an affinity space that exists where we can do all of that. So it feels so luxurious this weekend to be in this space, but also recording this episode together. Um, amazing, number. Yes. Um, yeah, she started her PhD and she was like, I'm gonna have so much free time. We should start a <laughs> podcast. <laughs> um, she didn't say that. She was, I think, smarter than that. But it's a ridiculous request at that time, I realize. <laughs> but I'm glad I'm glad it's still happening and we're in season three. It's very exciting. Um, so we're, we're diving deeper into affinity spaces. And I'm actually also uh, really honored to have been a performer at Mesmer We Fest yesterday morning at 7 a.m. Um, I, was <laughs> I was performing virtually and then came over to uh, Minatma uh, at 9 a.m. So what a lovely uh, morning that was yesterday. Uh, so we would love to just start with um, how each of you define an, an affinity space. In our uh, Minatma uh, programming committee meetings and conversations about this session, what an affinity space is and how it should function um, was, was not a trivial uh, for all of us to define. And so we wanted to know how you define that and uh, how they have played your role in your life as an artist, uh, if you haven't already spoken about that. Anyone can take this away. We're going to edit out all the giant pauses, <laughs> I think, maybe, maybe, in That's the nice in the final episode. Uh, for me, uh, an affinity space in my life career has been really directly uh, connected to advocacy um, and strength in numbers. So it's always been actually with an eye towards change making. I don't know if that's just because of the way I'm built, thank you parents, or um, just how it works within the specific identities that I hold 
um, queer organizing is um, messy and beautiful and difficult and um, in a lot of ways that definition of uh, making trouble through not necessarily agreement but in a line goal is something that I feel like um, within the theater space has been gifted to me from my elders and I, I'll like go all the way back to I don't know Tennessee Williams and beyond Oscar Wilde and beyond for this um, and in the MENA space it's really um, in my own journey as an immigrant where uh, an, an immigrant that ha is quite white passing uh, where assimilation was the goal for the first I don't know five to seven years of my life in the US and losing trying to lose my accent and trying to figure out how to be uh, pass as white American and feeling like I was just really truly bad at it <laughs> um, it took a space like Golden Thread, which is of course an affinity theater company, um, and realizing, not even realizing at the time what a luxury that was to be able to be in a space where I could say, I don't know if I'm this, I don't know if I'm that, I don't know how this works for me, um, I don't know if I'm Muslim, I have a lot of feelings as a queer man of defining as Muslim, and then being allowed to make plays about that and have conversations about that and say, possibly terrible things about that in safe spaces and being corrected or guided or just allowed to hit all of the walls and figure out where I stand and build my spine. Um, and the thing I will say for me for Affinity Space is it is a, uh, my experience with Affinity Spaces, especially within the Middle Eastern North African context, is a really American idea. Uh, yesterday we were having lunch and we were at a table with a Turkish American artist, an Iranian Armenian American artist, a Azeri Armenian artist, and an Armenian artist. And we had to sort of laugh that in this given moment that um, this lunch wouldn't happen anywhere else. And that, mm -hmm. and we were really having a deep, wonderful conversation about representation and translation and the impossibility of finding words from one language to another. Uh, this like really deep, lovely artistic conversation about Chekhov and beyond, and that was the context, was an affinity space that really felt um, in a certain way American, in a certain way San Franciscan, in a certain way Golden Thread and Manatma only possible space. Um, and I grew up there as an artist, so it feels so second nature to me. And it's been a real learning uh, working in more mainstream theaters, larger theaters, and meeting so many Middle Eastern North African act artists of Middle Eastern North African descent who haven't had that luxury of growing up and having their salt spines built solid around political and representation issues mm -hmm. and the like true emotional and mental, which is sometimes physical suffering they have to go through or have had to go through mm -hmm. um, in theater specifically, um, I, I feel lucky to have grown up in an affinity space like this, um, and an affinity space that is intersectional, that is uh, allows me to be all the things I am and not have to explain myself all the time. Um, and I, in a way, like wish that on every young artist, you know, uh, because it, it is, it is nice to be seen, it is nice to be heard, and it is nice to not have to translate yourself all the time. Um. <clears throat> I was uh, born in the United States and um, didn't grow up in a location where I had access to an Arab or Middle Eastern community for most of my childhood. Um, and I want to acknowledge that I grew up in what feels like now a very, very different time in terms of queer identity in the United States. Um, I'm a dyke of a certain age. I made a big deal of turning 50 on social media this year, so I'm not afraid to say it. <laughs> um, and <laughs> and um, and I and I'm I'm going to say something, and then I, I'm going and then I'm going to qualify it. I was uh, I was in my process of coming out. I was very afraid that Arab and Middle Eastern community spaces would not accept me because of my queerness. Now, I need to say, I grew up in a predominantly Christian, rural, Pennsylvania environment that was so deeply homophobic 
in the 80s that I literally mm -hmm. thought someone would kill me, literally kill me, if I came out. So mm -hmm. I think we often get stuck in this like narrative that uh, you know somehow Arab and Middle Eastern communities are more homophobic than anyone else. I'm saying rural Christian America, right? Um, and so those affinity spaces, queer affinity spaces, were key to feeling safe as a queer person in, as a young artist. And am I allowed to cuss? <laughs> Shit has changed. Like, I am amazed by young folks talking about transgender identity, questioning gender, questioning the relationship between sexuality and gender, which wasn't even a conversation we had then at all or language for. Like, there has been extraordinary progress. And um, I think now that I look back on it with this question, what was truly transformative for me was that when Arab spaces welcomed me as a queer person, and I, I didn't need an affinity space because the whole space was welcoming. And I have to name, because I think it's important that we remember our history and we name people, Barbara Namely Aziz was the first person to ever give me a radio interview, the first person to invite me to Rawi to be on a panel about the intersection of queer and Arab identity. Um, it, and it's really important that here, here at Golden Thread in this convening, there has been 50% or more on the regular daily and pretty much everything queer representation. Woohoo! Yes, <laughs> beautiful and amazing and powerful and just not questioned. And so that makes me go, wouldn't it be nice if we just didn't need affinity spaces anymore and every space was like this? Um, yeah, I was thinking about this and s moving to the Bay Area in the early aughts, uh, I remember being very clear that I had three distinct identities as an Iranian, uh, as, a, as a woman, and then as a lesbian, and that I would play different cards depending on which room I was in. Um, <laughs> And then I also thought that I never quite felt enough of any one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, and so I remember with uh, Evra and I share a group of very close friends. And it was in their company one drunken night. I was, I was outside. And I used to call myself Sarah. Everybody called me Sarah. And I was drunk. And there was some Middle Eastern guy. He was drunk. And his name was... Uh, Mamad and he called himself Mo and I'm like no Mo are you gonna go by Mamad <laughs> <laughs> and my friends overheard it and they're like well what about you why are you going by Sarah you can be Sara mm -hmm. and it changed then I started going by Sara and it's a very easy way of telling uh, you know who knows me who doesn't if they call me Sarah or Sara mm -hmm. but that in that moment, it felt like, oh, my Iranian self and my American self maybe can live, live closely together. Mm -hmm. But it kept having these moments. And I remember I did a show with a wonderful theater company in the Bay. And I took my then girlfriend to it. This is a room full of very queer artists. And I told her, I said, we can't be queer here because they're Middle Eastern. Mm -hmm. And we went through this whole party, and I remember being so amazed at how wonderful, how drunk, how great they all were. But I was like, we can't be queer around them. So up until a very, very long period, these worlds were completely separate. And now, I think the only reason I'm probably here is because I live it so loudly and so comfortably. Mm -hmm. um, and that shift happened, though, over time. And I take your point, because even deciding as a, as a queer woman whether I wear mascara or not. Because when I moved to the Bay, you had to be very butch or you had to be very femme. And even that identity of like mm -hmm. how I present myself as a queer woman um, has taken time. And now I recognize just this living is radical in and of itself. Mm -hmm. and, and it's an example for so many folks that I've only realized it because I suddenly 
recognize I hadn't see, seen it as much. So anyway, when I was thinking about affinity, I was really thinking, for me, the longest time it had been so separate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Taras, do you want to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think for me, I see uh, affinity perhaps like a community care, like practicing community care in an intangible and in material ways, like how, how do we show up for each other in each other's lives? How do we move um, together in the world? Um, who do we bring into solutions with us? I think also, um, you know, I feel like um, a lot of organizing is really around education and education, uh, educating folks about concepts that um, might be like what Evelyn was saying. I, I don't know if I'm butchering your name, but like uh, pushing the envelope kind of in the forward. And I, I would like to invite us all. Like I think this is a good example of that because you know I was sharing feedback with Marina um, prior to the call, and I'm so glad that you brought um, those pieces of feedback and you integrated them so quickly into the program, um, like uh, about the Nakba and affirming that the occupation of Palestine has been since 1948. Um, but I want to invite us all to see queerness. Um, definitely, it is a sexual. Uh, identity, but beyond the sexual yes. and, and gender as well, beyond the sexual mm -hmm. and beyond um, gender to see it as something uh, sort of a political decision mm -hmm. as well. Right. Um, today, I see like nobody in the world is more queer than those in Gaza, you know, the way that they're, they are invisibilized, the way they are demonized, mm -hmm. the way they are intentionally mm -hmm. silenced, the way there is a genocide against them, the mm -hmm. same way that there was a genocide here against queer people in the form of the uh, AIDS HIV um, pandemic, uh, so to speak, they call it an epidemic, but it affected more than just queer people, it affected Haitians as well. Um, it affected you know, working class uh, black folk. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was having this conversation a little bit with uh, my uh, also fellow uh, colleague on the rally board, uh, Zandra Haddad, an amazing uh, transgender writer and organizer um, but about like how do we push those boundaries of queerness beyond um, and how do we see and also with uh, George Ibrahim about like how Palestinianness is a form of queerness in a way just the way it's constantly mar marginalized the way it's constantly pushed uh, to the side mm -hmm. um, and I want us to well, not necessarily right now but to kind of like uh, reflect on that question uh, and carry it with us as we make our way uh, back home together you sort of inspired me to um, I just uh, want to say that uh, I do think I use the term queer rather than gay to define mm -hmm. myself one because mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to be that specific about who I sleep with as I identify myself mm -hmm. for some reason it feels like none of your business <laughs> um, and mm -hmm. also um, for me queer is a political term yes. Uh, and a very specific political term, because um, I'm so glad you brought up the HIV AIDS epidemic, uh, talking about the failure of our government to take care of people as we look at what they're doing right now. Mm -hmm. We have a long history of this, and that's just one example among so many. Um, what I find very moving is the AIDS funerals, <laughs> the funerals of the people who were killed by neglect mm -hmm. as well as this virus mm -hmm. were celebrations mm -hmm. drag parties mm -hmm. dance parties and um, I feel like uh, I, I look at our theater just I'll speak about my art form and I feel like joy has been gentrified mm -hmm. that there is this idea mm -hmm. that like there's a white woman cis white woman version of joy that has, and if I actually claim joy as my resistance, which I say all the time, like I am negating the pain and the grief and the rage that we're all feeling. Mm -hmm. And having grown up over there, I un have a sort of lived understanding of people who are under the worst conditions, that they are the funniest, they are the mm -hmm. campiest, they mm -hmm. are the most satirical mm -hmm. in uh, certain places. And for me, um, I am queering theater uh, actually feels very similar to the political actions of Middle Easterning theater, mm -hmm. which is That's really right. about living in 
comedy as political action, as community joy and claiming that despite the fact that we're all being killed to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And and I, this is something that is really difficult for me to let go of, especially as I work in mainstream spaces where the card I have to play is pain to get a job. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I feel mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. affinity, yeah, they, they want my trauma, some of which I don't actually have, by the way. I had a lovely upbringing <laughs> as a queer boy. Mm-hmm. My family was wonderful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> don't and, tell anyone. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but like, I, like the, the second, if I'm doing this panel not led by Middle Eastern or uh, conscious folks, the first question is like, how was growing up queer? <laughs> Ask with that soft white tone of care. Yeah. That is actually not care. That's an invitation to perform my pain that I do not have. Um, So it is, and this is not to negate all of the really terrible experiences queer folks have had in Turkey. So I, and as I say this, I feel like I'm sort of not representing something, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have to talk about it on this podcast because everyone here understands. Um, But the thing for me is, as we talk about queerness, as we talk about affinity space, for me, affinity space is also where I get to be unabashedly joyful Mm -hmm. and celebratory and unapologetic, not just politically, but as friends, as colleagues, as co-conspirators, and that we hold each other accountable to that as we make space for our rage and grief, which is like my, I am adding that to every community agreement from now on, by the way. It is like the most brilliant addition. I can't remember who proposed it, but my God. Um, So I just wanna say that that's, that idea of joy and political, joy as political action is, lives in my body, both in my queerness and my Middle Easternness. Mm-hmm. And I wanna claim mm-hmm. that for this space. Mm-hmm. 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 So yes, Evren, that was so beautiful. And it re- takes me back to something that Hamid Sino said earlier, which I was know. like, you <laughs> can't, don't use me talking about queerness, I'm paraphrasing them wildly. Um, but don't use my queerness to pinkwash, and don't use my queerness yes, for part of your political or colonial or imperial agenda. Right. And that's where joy gets in the way of people who try to use these stories for that purpose. Um, mm-hmm. And I want to add to what you're saying, my favorite mm-hmm. bell hooks quote, if you'll indulge. Anytime we can like throw a, a, an amazing <laughs> black feminist into the space, I feel like we should. Um, but queer, not as in being about who you're having sex with, that can be a dimension of it, but queer is being about the self that is at odds with everything around it, and it has to invent yeah. and create and find a place to speak and to thrive and to live. Um, so yeah. I love that. It's very much what uh, Evren and Faras were just uh, saying, but I wanted to throw Hooks and Hamid Sino into the mix. Yeah. Thank you for that, Nicole. Yeah. I'm having You've t- already touched on a lot of what we were going <laughs> to talk about, so l- we should just end the podcast here. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> we're not going to. We're, we're here for 20 more minutes. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the things that I, I wanted to go a little deeper into, uh, you've each talked about how, uh, kind of how, and the, a little bit of the journey of how the affinity spaces have become intersectional for you or have presented themselves as as being open to intersectional identities, and there's you know, uh, uh, folks often will talk about you know um, the the tensions of being Mina or Swana in queer spaces and the tensions of being queer in Mina or Swana spaces, um, as you've some of you some of you have touched on, but can you identify what are the aspects of affinity spaces that have have made a platform, a supportive platform for your intersecting identities. Um, some of you have had uh, experience with spaces that have been one or the other. You've had to turn on and off certain identities. But in those spaces where you had, you were able to bring your full self, mm-hmm. are you able to articulate what are the elements of the that kind of affinity space that has allowed for you to bring your full self with all of your intersecting identities? Um, and, and those listening can learn from that, hopefully, um, and cr- curate better affinity spaces moving forward. Um, as as to everyone was talking, I was remembering one of the best spaces was the annual Golden Thread Party, mm-hmm. um, where we would bring lots of food 
and dancing. And one of the moments I probably felt the most seen, you and I were on the dance floor. <laughs> And there was great drumming going on. Just uh, it, was, it was all very out of the blue. Suddenly drums showed up. Suddenly someone was uh, singing. And I feel like uh, he probably had more, you know, what do you hip action, <laughs> hip action <laughs> that I could muster. <laughs> and I probably had more shoulder action than he could muster. And between the two of us, we were doing this extremely queer, completely role reversal dance. Uh, in the living room of one of our uh, founding board members. That, to me, speaks to everything that's been said, the joy of it, uh, the fluidity of it, the queerness of it, and yet the complete Middle Easternness of it um, was, w gave me, constantly gave, gives me joy and great memories. Uh, just so it is said, I did <laughs> dance her off the dance floor. <laughs> Not that it was he a competition, insists, but I did insists. win. We have had many rematches. I think I've won some of them. But I yes. disagree. Uh, I would say, really, um, people matter more than words for me. Actions matter more than words for me. I think we're in a place right now in the American theater where we have to say, like, all of the right words for some. We feel like the words are the welcoming thing. And I would rather mm -hmm. people show up in their imperfect language, but with open hearts. And I understand that I sit in a very privileged body to be able to say this. I also want to own that. Uh, but for me, what makes an affinity space welcoming is that people look me in the eye say, and say, welcome. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And when I correct them, they say, I'm so sorry, and then just try to use the right pronoun on, or call me queer rather than something else or apologize for an assumption they made. Um, I am a little over perfection before arrival as a requirement mm -hmm. of an affinity space as because I think that's as activists, as organizers, and I think everyone on here probably defines with the, uh, identifies with those words at different levels, but we all are, <laughs> uh, having knowing everybody's work to a certain extent. Um, we keep leaving behind people who are actually really important by doing that. Mm -hmm. And as mm -hmm. someone uh, who lives in very liberal spaces and then is supposed to represent not necessarily people in theater who might actually have those words or believe those things, or they are welcoming, but they actually don't know that that's the word you use for that thing. Mm. Um, I'm always sort of negotiating that for myself as I try to create space and represent this impossibly large umbrella of folks called Middle Eastern, North African, or Muslim. Uh, uh, I try to figure out how to make space for people who are coming from different spaces and make sure they feel welcome and they have an understanding of the rules of engagement rather than uh, correcting people's verbiage. Mm -hmm. um, Everin, can we model what you just said? Yes. Because um, I'm sitting here and I, I, appreciate, I appreciate the feminist impulse that you started the panel with to mm -hmm. acknowledge and say I'm so happy to be up here with, but I don't identify as femme. That's fantastic. Yeah, because I really mm. suck at femme. <laughs> I've tried and I, I fail miserably. It's like queer failure all over. I can't, I can't do it. I am very <laughs> sorry to have used that term to define Oh, no, you. but I do, you're correct that I do identify as a cisgendered, cisgendered woman, cisgender woman, and that that is a space of privilege that I inhabit. And so these are the kinds of, co I'm just we're doing the conversation. We're like, that was the thing we want you all to do. <laughs> and we want spaces to do, right? Yeah. Just like have that conversation. But actually I wanted to, um, I really want to dig a little deeper into the joy and trauma conversation. Is that okay? Yeah, of course. Can I go there? Um, Cause I'm thinking about everything you said and how that resonates with me about joy and queer space and also I'm thinking about my own work which dives deep into trauma mm -hmm. often right mm -hmm. and uh and I was very much as a as an activist 
and I and I also embrace the word queer because I do think of it as a as a much larger political framework than uh, than only my sexuality, and that you know that is resisting um, the normativity or the the like the seduction of capitalism, right, and and, and like pushing back uh, on all levels of uh, political analysis. Um, but you know, I I was formed as a as a young queer person coming out and as a young activist in the 90s during the AIDS crisis uh, where our, the slogan was, don't mourn, organize. And we did that and we never mourned. <laughs> and we carried that grief for more than a decade, right? Mm -hmm. And and then, um, and that, that's, that, it still hurts us. Mm -hmm. It still hurts us. And so I think that a lot of my work around trauma is about creating safe spaces to mourn. Right. Collectively, publicly, to cry, to, to be witnessed mourning. And also there might be a, like, queer Elvis impersonator in the middle of the Duran project. Because mm -hmm. that's also important to me, right? Like that, those moments of like, um, like, to get, like, let's go deep into the morning and face our trauma and face our complicity as US citizens mm -hmm. in what our country is mm -hmm. doing. And also be queer and joyous in the same process, right? So that's what I'm, I feel sometimes that like there's this either or thing happening that I also want to disrupt. Absolutely, absolutely Andrea. I, uh, I love that you mentioned that because um, first of all, I want to thank you for mentioning Dada Abraja Mijahi for naming her um, as the gallery founder. I, I we all are indebted to her. And actually, like the Mijma Rally Fest was exactly a space, just as you mentioned. Like we had moments of uh, mourning, of collective mourning, mm -hmm. and we had moments of collective joy, mm -hmm. and we had moments of uh, practicing collective care and support, um, and moments of creation as well. And you know, as we all know, as artists, you know, that's the place um, where we create from, um, or where we write towards too. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, to touch on what Evelyn was saying as well, like about uh, mining the trauma, you know, we face a similar predicament with pa as Palestinians, you know, mm -hmm. that's your displacement story. That's what the media is always interested in, mm -hmm. but never in like, okay, what brought us to that, to this moment? So I really appreciate um, uh, naming a and naming, you know, the root causes of um, the violence that we, we just encountered and naming those white supremacy structures that uphold colonialism as a violent structure in of itself and therefore an act of resistance becomes really an act of love, right? And resistance is resistance. Um, even if the state, if it, even if it manifests in violence, I believe that it's um, a lesser evil <laughs> to use liberal uh, talk. Um, but to answer the question that was asked, I think like when it comes to some of these spaces, like I think it's all about really removing the barriers um, to entry. And that's something that, again, like we try really hard to do uh, with Rawi and Mijma. Um, like, for example, with how do we make it more accessible for disabled folks? And that's why we chose like to do a hybrid um, festival and required masks um, and, and, you know, asking people to vaccinate before or at least, uh, you know, take uh, their tests, even though knowing that tests are, you know, um, not as effective with certain strains. Um, you know, it's also making space for plurality, whatever manifestation that takes. Like we're expanding beyond uh, the Arab-speaking world into, you know, entering Tijuana and beyond as well with joint struggle uh, partners uh, with our indigenous, black, uh, Asian, uh, Latinx siblings. Um, again, challenging and uh, resisting anti-colonial, anti-imperialist structures removing barriers to entry for working class people in terms of economics as, as well, because class is a very important dynamic that um, we should all, um, you know, make space for and um, always look below on the food chain, like what do, you know, what do unhoused folk, folks need? Um, how do we bring them into the room? And always like thinking about who's not in the room and how do we bring them into the room? And that was a lovely practice 
that I witnessed um, uh, this past weekend, and um, it was something that, you know, because it helps us multiply, right? Like, um, every time we bring somebody that is not in the room, we bring them into the room, then our numbers decrease, right? And that is how we build power, that is how we build care. Um, I believe that is the way uh, the future, a, liv a livable future, if I uh, may say, you know, I mean, how do we push back against white supremacy? How do we confront our own uh, anti-blackness within uh, certain Arab communities as well? Um, there's so much to unlearn and so much to learn as well. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate this conversation and uh, where, it's, where it's going. Um, thank you all. Thank you so much for bringing up um, the, the other intersections that we have to uh, be considering when expanding and transforming and growing our affinity spaces uh, because a you know queer and Mina and Swana friendly space is not necessarily disability friendly it's not it's not necessarily mm -hmm. anti-black you know so um, I love the thank you for bringing in especially those very specific examples as to how Ms. Aminori are doing that I know Golden Thread is also doing that I know Minatma is also working on that in all it, and that's that's working for all of us you know it, it's mm -hmm. it's it's work for all of us um mm -hmm. and and is a constant um a growth process and it's it's interesting to start thinking about you know as we become more inclusive and this is something we've also been exploring in this season as we become more and more um uh, inclusive of intersection uh what does an affinity space mean and I love the ways that each of you all have defined affinity space because it, it, uh, it, it's it's a definition that that is hard to put on paper. You know, you've kind of defined it through the it, through the vibe or the 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 way in which your joy can be present in that space, the way in which your grief, your rage, your emotion, what's inside of you can be present in a space, which is is very different from saying it's a room in which everyone is Mina and Swana and queer, uh, which mm -hmm. is an interesting way to, to think about that and to think about how we ex grow and expand and um, create, create more intersectional affinity spaces. I also mm -hmm. wanted to touch on something else you brought up, Faraz, which is uh, this hybrid model. So today we're in mm -hmm. person, we're live streaming, we're sharing this asynchronously Beautiful. on Konefa and Shay. And living in a more hybrid world, considerations of the merits and drawbacks of in-person versus live versus hybrid gatherings have become very ubiquitous. And while mm -hmm. art making has become, been multimedia since really the beginnings of advancements in technology, virtuality has become an even more present consideration, especially for performing artists. So how do you consider physical space in your community building, in your affinity mm -hmm. creation, and in your art making? We have about five minutes left, so we'll do this sort of more rapid fire. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I, I'll also throw in there, um, you know, considerations of safety um, and affinity within virtual spaces that can be so much grander, can be international. Um, you know, how do you consider that when it comes to your community, community building and affinity um, curation, I guess? Yeah. Um, I'll jump in and say, um, I'm just gonna like throw a wrench in here, which is gender. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, because the, the spaces that I like to create, maybe because I miss them, because so many have disappeared, are, are women-only spaces, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that is trans-inclusive, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I do that a lot in my work, in my art making. I'm like, I, I'm like my, my joy and pleasure is in women ensemble spaces. And, mm -hmm. um, and there, you know, and again, we, there's, there, was a, there was a period of time when there were lots of, and this is so ironic, right? It's ironic because Middle Eastern and Muslim communities get criticized all the time for having gender segregation in certain in public, right? Yeah. And yet, <laughs> and yet, women-only spaces are like my favorite places to be. <laughs> and and so and so when I'm thinking about creating spaces of safety, mm -hmm. it's often around gender identification, 
that is inclusive, inclusive of trans, non-binary, and various sexualities, rather than around uh, sexual identity-defined space in my own work, in my own artistic practice. And so, um, I don't know, I, d I, I kind of wanted to lift up that, like when we're making our own ensembles, we're in a sense making our own affinity spaces, right? We mm -hmm. gather people in a certain way to create together and, and to create the safety in which we can do our best work or ask mm -hmm. the deepest questions or share the deepest stories, right? And so, um, I don't know, maybe that's where I'm at is like making and remaking those, those spaces I don't know if that answered the question, but that was just what I, I love it. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say, uh, we've been using the word affinity space, which tends to be, uh, usually goes with an idea of limiting identity, limiting attendance by identity, mm -hmm. however that identity mm -hmm. is defined. Um, and I'm in a place, um, we just, uh, in the uh, conference, just had this really beautiful conversation across different networks of color um, representing all sorts of communities, all sorts of backgrounds, and the intersectionality of our goals and resources that is needed. And I think uh, I was using this term two days ago to a friend where I was like, I'm just looking for my people. Mm -hmm. And my people includes many, many, many Middle Eastern Muslim queer folks but also Nataki Garrett, who is a cis black woman, is my people. Eric Ting, who is an Asian American yeah. cis straight man, is my people. Mayan Tio, Asian American queer femme human, is my people. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm always trying to figure out as I build ensemble or as I build space, especially if the space is either around political action, change making, or it's about difficult conversation or processing, mm -hmm. whether that be through mm -hmm. laughter or tears, as you said, Andrea. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking for my people and trying to make sure that the people in the room um, share some understanding. Mm -hmm. And I wish, I, I, as I said, I've just started using this term, so I don't know if I have the articulation of how that is defined for me. Uh, mm -hmm. But the thing I can say is that I know when someone is and when someone isn't. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. is not necessarily across identity lines for me always. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the thing I will say about the digital aspect of the question you asked, social media, the digital space that has really sp sprung up even more now uh, <coughs> due to the pandemic and the isolation we all felt through that, has expanded my community, has done great things for my career, has done great things for my organizing and activist, activism and advocacy. Um, and then we ha I attend a conference like this in person and remember that I'm an in-person person. person. <laughs> right, so it's a, it's a for me, and as I haven't been back home for so long and my brother lives in a screen as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. um, I feel like it's all of it, mm -hmm. um, and it has to be. And if you're an immigrant or children are immigrants, or um, and it's really telling to me that in this moment of unbearable violence, the thing that Israel is doing is to shut down internet access, mm -hmm. right? That is a violent act right now. Mm -hmm. And if that is the case, we have to accept that digital space and that access mm -hmm. is community, mm -hmm. is access to truth. Mm -hmm. And that does not negate the need for me to hug my brother <laughs> right when I see him next. Um, but it is both, and it has mm -hmm. to be. Does anyone else want to comment on this before we wrap up? Yeah, I have. So I'll keep it short just because I know that we're short on time. And, um, but I would like to say some things that we're unexpected in the community. Uh, I guess it's because, you know, I, we're all indigenous to somewhere. And um, I invite everybody to invite the folks in their lives, especially <laughs> white folks or folks that have not touched them yet. Where are you from, basically? Where do you come from? Uh, we get asked that question. A lot, I guess, of otherized, uh, racialized uh, people of other subjects. 
And I think that it's time to push that question, you know, back. And because, and it's also like important for each one of us to know where we come from. I believe James Baldwin said that that you know you'll never be able to move forward until you confront your own past, right? And you know where you come from. And um, to mark your journey, because there's a celebration there of your growth of how far you you've come. Um, so yeah, I mean, just like to ask uh, each other and ourselves. Where do we come from? And to return to that place. Um, a, a, a beautiful, wonderful writer, and also he's a performance artist, uh, who I love very much. His name is Farza Fabasi. Um, uh, says that the, the future is a past uh, that we return to, and I truly believe that. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you all so much for this wonderful talk today. Thank you. Um, we're going to end the way that Number and I end all of our episodes, our phone calls, the way that you might have ended um, the 20 minute goodbye at Hafil or to his house um, <laughs> with a nice yellow bye. Uh, so, can we do it all as a group? As loud as you can it's so all the mics can it. pick them up. All right? Yeah. Okay. Are you ready? <laughs> yellow bye, everyone. One, two, three. Yellow, yellow bye! bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so, so much. much for joining us. Thank you so much, Faraz. Bye. Bye. Don't close Zencaster yet. I see your hand. We're done with the episode, but we can continue to chat.